kind of pushing the envelope, and nowhere is that more true than in uh, social media. So we're ending up, um, we're going to be doing a monthly webinar series for higher ed, and, and we're starting with this one, but continuing into 2015, we'll be addressing uh, a lot of the, you know, Educause top 10 issues and, and uh, so forth. <coughs> so uh, Mark, if you could just advance the slide there. <clears throat> okay, so uh, first I wanted to, you know, my name is Brian Flora, I'm a principal at Beyond 20, and uh, I've got with me Andy Rivers, who's uh, one of our uh, consultants here, Andy's the former associate CIO for the University of Tennessee statewide system, and we're fortunate to have him on staff here as uh, both an ITIL and ITSM consultant as well as a, a trainer, and he's just been a great resource for us in this space, uh, as well as uh, Mark Hilliard, who's one of our solution architects text and he's going to be managing the webinar for us today as well as um, uh, possibly demonstrating some of these things and in, in giving us some real world examples. So Andy and I are here in our in the Beyond 20 Washington DC office and Mark's coming from the office in, uh, in Phoenix, Arizona. But I'm going to kind of hand uh, this over to Andy to, uh, to drive here in just a second. Uh, Mark, can you uh, give us the next slide? Okay, so you know a little bit about Beyond 20 for those of you who, who don't know us. We are a 360-degree consulting firm with uh, deep expertise in in ITIL and Agile project management. So ITSM accounts for probably 80% of what we do and where we derive our revenue. This is really at the core of, of what we literally think about and work with uh, every single day is uh, not only doing ITIL training and, and assessments and that sort of thing, but also uh, helping organizations to take these uh, best practices out of the book and, and put those in practice. And as I mentioned, you know, higher education is a space that's really near and dear to us that we uh, spend a lot of time uh, working with and, uh, and a lot of time around the office uh, talking about these particular kinds of challenges and and uh, we've all been pretty excited to you know get started with this um, with this webinar series and, and we thank you for for joining us on it and uh, on that I'll just go ahead and um, hand it off to Andy and to uh, to take us out Mark you want to take us to the next slide all right thanks Brian Hey, uh, one of the things we really wanted to do with this series was give you hands-on things you could do. Um, so we're, we're going to talk about some theory and some things, you know, behind why you want to do this, but we wanted to make it a little bit more practical. Uh, um, I'm not sure, I know I've sat through many of these where I left and I was like, well, that's a lot of good ideas, but I'm not real sure what to do next. Um, and so what we want, really wanted to do was focus on here's some good ideas and here's how you can actually capitalize on them. Um, and so that's kind of what our, our five things are geared around, are some things that you can take immediate action on to start improving things um, within your university or, or within your company, if you happen to be with a company and not with a university. Um, so one of the things we wanted to start out with was um, this idea of adding the social media contacts to um, an individual's identity profile. Um, so, you know, some people say, well, why do we want to do that? Um, I know I had been in many meetings where people were fearful about trying to add these identities that we didn't manage, we couldn't control. You know, how are we going to manage this? How do we really know this is them? You know, all those questions, and, and sometimes we kind of let that fear and doubt um, override us, really capitalizing on some of these things. Um, one of the things that, you know, this allows us to do, if we start really trying to tie in these ideas of social media identities um, into our main identities is, it allows us to do, I'll go ahead and state one of the obvious ones is, let's say if email is down or, you know, the network's down, some of these things that we can, we can get out of band communications to the users. And so we can get some notification to them that says email is down and now it's broadcasted on Facebook and Twitter. So you're not relying on the service that's actually down to also broadcast your messages. So, so that's one real win. Um, the big wins, the more value that we actually see is, is if you start really leveraging this to be more of an interaction between the users. Um, you know, how do, we, how do we get more interactions with them where we're meeting them where they're already at? They're already in Twitter, they're already using Facebook, so how do we drive those interactions with our users and not forcing them to come to us and not forcing them to go to other mechanisms? Um, you know, some of the things that, that we're going to show here in a minute 
and it's how you can actually start you know creating tickets um, updating tickets all those things directly by using these social media tools um, and so one of the big values you can get out of this first step of actually tying the identities together is just that more interaction like I said you're kind of meeting them where they're at. Um, the other huge one is, um, you know, universities are unique in the fact that we really want to keep track of everybody that has been on our campus. After they graduate, after they're gone, we want to maintain that relationship with them much more than really any other business does. Because um, uh, I'm sure you all, if you've graduated, you still get those little letters to uh, to donate, that sort of stuff. So that, that's the obvious one where most people think, oh, they just want to keep track of me to get money, um, which uh, obviously that is a little, little bit of the reason. But one of the other big things is most of our uni universities care if we're successful. They want to know, did we turn out well? Did we empower their brand? Um, you know, can they come back? Can we do some uh, some sort of where are they now article and their and their uh, newsletters and those types of things? And what we can do by allowing the social media to contacts to be part of our identity is it's much easier to keep track of them after they leave the university. Um, I've been part of three different universities as a student, um, have worked for multiple ones, um, and I would say. There's really only one I still even maintain that email address, that university provided email address. Um, but I still have had the consistent, you know, same Facebook profile I've had since I created one. Same thing with Twitter. You know, those things will remain constant much more than most of their social identity, or much much more than the university IDs will. Um, so, yeah, I think that opens up uh, an interesting. So, you know, Mark's kind of showing us here. Uh, on screen, you know how we could have that included in a customer profile. I think, you know, in this case, this one's a, as part of the ShareWell Service Management. But, but you know, that that does open up an interesting conversation around, you know, what customers are actually using. And I, you know, we've certainly had these conversations around the office, Andy. But you know, the idea that um, that a lot of times, you know, a college student will enter, will come on campus now, and maybe we provision them a new. Uh, you know, a new email address, but they already have an email account. And today, that's you know, both their personal cell phone and maybe their email account. That Gmail account that they've had for a long time is is going to be a much more durable and permanent way of keeping track of them. And the same thing goes for a Twitter handle and and uh, and so forth. Uh, Mark, did you have anything you wanted to? Yeah, I think the other thing, and this is more uh, talking from you know standpoint of while well, they're on campus and while they're actually still involved is, yeah, they're going to be checking those things much more often, which means if I have your Twitter handle, um, you know, I can, from my own ITSM tool, uh, like, you know, something like Sherwell, I can actually, I can actually modify my, my Twitter blasts to actually hit those, those individuals who are, are looking to get the information that I've got to give out. If, you know, someone has, if someone has reported an outage, um, you know, by email or by phone or anything like that, and they're looking for an answer, they may not be checking their email, they may be walking across campus with their phone, but their Twitter feed is probably off, which means right. if I go and tweet, tweet directly at that person, they're going to see that more instantly, and they're, they're, they're going to get the resolution that they're looking for you know, in a package that they're used to using. Yeah, and to go along with that, we've actually found that this is a better mechanism most of the time than chat. Um, because chat, they have to engage us in real time. They have to stay there throughout the conversation. Um, whereas if we do methods like Twitter or Facebook, um, we're able to respond and update their information, and they can come back and consume it on their own time. Um, that's really what that's, you know, that's what Twitter and Facebook are kind of conditioning us to do. I check my feed, I see how things are going, I go off and do other things, I come back and see is there anything new, is, has anybody shared anything new, has my question been answered, um, and so we're actually kind of fitting into that model rather than forcing them into our other support model. Yeah, you know, that brings up a really good point, and that's that, you know, we talk a lot about live chat and uh, you know, implementing these these live chat type methodologies for the service desk, and and in some organizations it's it's effective. And I think you know, don't get me wrong, I think that's an improvement over email in many cases. But at the same time, if you're anything like me, I've had a lot of live chat experiences where basically it ends up, you know, I type into the window and then I have to basically sit there and wait for somebody to respond. And and uh, you know, it, it is a quicker turnaround than email, but I also can't just leave it. I can't you know leave that window and go do something else because 
turns out that you know I forget about it, and 60 seconds later, by the time I come back, it's uh, someone has popped up and said, "Are you there? Are you there? Are you there?" Three times, and I'm, and you know they're gone, and I'm back in the queue. Um, or you know, worse yet, you get uh, you know live chat gets you to somebody that isn't really empowered to do anything, so you spend you know 10 minutes on the phone, on the, the live chat, and then at the end of it, they just tell you to call anyway. Uh, but you know, social media does give you give you a little bit more of an ability, as you said, to to consume these things in your own time. Right, and I yeah, think I that's think a good. That, go ahead, Mark. I was going to say I think that works on the flip side as well. So you have you, know, you have your technicians who might be sitting in a chat window, and 15 other chats come up, and they don't have time to get to everybody right away. So again, they you walk away and they respond and then they don't actually, they're not providing the service that you really want. But, you know, if they're just following a feed on a dashboard, then, you know, and they know that they're going to get back to you and you're going to follow that feed and wait until you get, you know, you get a hashtag back, then that's going to, that's going to make you happier as a customer and it's going to, it's going to make the service, the service desk appear much more responsive, I think, than just a straight live chat solution because, you know, until, when, once you run out of text on the service desk, nobody can answer a live chat request. Right, right. So, uh, so that brings up the next point where we were basically talking about, okay, so can we start accepting tickets from social media? And, and by that, now some of this might be a little more revolutionary for some of you than others, but we're talking about like actually enabling your customers to submit an incident to your service desk or request via Twitter, via a Facebook page, you know, something like that, a Facebook post or, or what have you, to be able to monitor those things and actually interface directly a seamless integration with the with the service desk and uh, and Mark can show some of that in a um, in a second here in the meantime I want to do kind of a little informal poll uh, if you guys could just respond in the uh, in the chat or the question pane uh, what service management tool are you using today so what are you guys uh, using on your service desk or as your primary tool for incident management problem management change management that that kind of thing We'll give you a moment to, to answer there. I've got a couple of service nows. Request tracker, uh, we do have a shareable user out there. Yep, looks like we've got a couple of track it's, a couple of uh, remedy, of course, yes. Okay, so pretty pretty wide uh, representation here, and you know the follow up for that is, does your current platform allow you to support social media interaction, or rather integration, like what we're talking about? Well, while folks are answering, Mark, you want to kind of walk us through what you've what you've got here in this dashboard? Sure, absolutely. So this is this is really um, just kind of a kind of a bit of a fancy dashboard, but really what it's just giving me from you know from my Sherlock sure IPSM tool is a snapshot of you know what we've what we've got in our queue, incidents that are open, requests and problems and so forth. But what I also have here is this uh, what we call a widget uh, that shows me a Twitter feed. Um, and what I can do is not only can I follow this feed as it updates uh, throughout the day, but I can take any one of these tweets and simply create a ticket directly from it. So, you know, if I have this tweet here that says, you know, unable to ac access my email through OWA, really all I have to do is I just uh, I just go down here to my action of a right click and say I want to create an incident from this tweet. And what that does is it actually pulls in it pulls in the tweet information. Um, and goes and creates an incident. Um, in this case, I actually just threw myself an error, but um, the idea being is that the tweet itself actually becomes the description of my uh, the description of my actual uh, my actual incident. Um, and I can even do things like if if this particular user happens to be in my database again, as we added as we add uh, social media information to our database for our various end users. Um, I can even translate that directly into a username in the system, which allows 
which allows me to automatically know who my requester is, even if even if their Twitter handle is, you know, John the Baptist, perhaps this person is actually named, you know, John Smith, but I don't know that until I actually go and create that create that ticket from the tweet, and now I know exactly who I'm dealing with. Um, additionally, you know, at that point, I can actually send information back out via the Twitter feed um, from the ticket itself, or if there's a problem, I can actually tweet workarounds directly. Um, so if we look at, uh, if we actually were to bring up our problem list here um, and say, you know, we have an upstairs printer that's broken right now, um, and we actually have a workaround, I can actually tweet this known error directly out from the problem ticket into our system, um, and it lets me know that that known error was tweeted. Now if I actually go back to my dashboard, actually see that I've actually thrown out a, a tweet directly into my feed that says, hey, the upstairs printer is broken, and here's a workaround you can print to this print server here. Um, and again, people that are following that problem would then know, oh, okay, now I know what I've got to do. <clears throat> So this is kind of an interesting point you're making that, you know, I mean, there's a few different ways we've seen customers do this, and one of them is, you know, we could just automatically have anything, if you have like a private Twitter handle that you use for the service desk or for IT or something like that, you could just monitor that and automatically create incidents from it, but uh, other times what we see is that, you know, maybe we want this on our dashboard, and we're just sort of monitoring it, and it might, you know, give the, the opportunity to create an, an incident when you're seeing, uh, when you're seeing people talking about uh, issues that they're having, even if they're not directly calling you about it, you can be a little bit more uh, proactive and, and kind of get out ahead of things. I think one of the keys, too, that I like, you know, we were mentioning this is leveraging social media. So, you know, I like the fact that we're actually making a ticket from a Twitter feed. You know, the, the broadcasting is nice. We saw the value of that. You have a workaround. You broadcasted it out. But we're doing much more than that. We're having an interaction with them where, hey, I have a known problem. I'm already in Twitter. I'm just going to send this over to the help desk, and they're going to start working on it. They're going to create a ticket and start working on it. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay. So anyway, that's uh, that's just kind of, kind of an example of that uh, second second uh, tip that we were giving as far as being able to uh, process incidents from a, a Twitter feed or tickets or t incidents or service requests. Um, so the next thing, you know, the uh, the third thing that we were going to be looking at if, is uh, is allowing people to sort of almost subscribe, I would say, to um, to an open problem that you have or a system-wide issue. Uh, Andy, you want to? Yeah, so this is the idea of tying in, you know, the social aspect of social media. So you have the ability, how do people, if I see an issue there that I can say, hey, that affects me too, um, and get in on that feed so I'm not having to generate, in our cases, where you're not trying to generate another call back to our service desk, but you have the ability for people to say, hey, my email is not working correctly too. And so that allows you to do a few, uh, several things. Is I now have those users grouped together. Um, I can now see how big of a problem it is. And I've also not tied up my other method of communication. They're already corresponding to me with what they're using in. They're, they're basically saying this affects me too, which also on the flip side turns around and lets me blast out the fix for that issue to all of them at one time. Um, so it's made, it makes the front end of identifying them more efficient and it makes the back end of telling them the fix more efficient. Um, and again, we're, we're kind of trying to actually capitalize on the social aspect of this and kind of getting them um, almost like a crowdsourcing sort of aspect to it. And we got um, a little bit of a demo. We'll see if Mark can flip back over and show us. Yeah, I mean, for me, this is one of those things that, that has such a direct impact on, uh, on the bottom line and, and on one of the major metrics we care about. And it's, it's about, like, ha helping us to reduce the number of calls to the service desk and from, from an end user perspective, allowing me to... Uh, not necessarily have to pick up the phone and, and interact to be able to you know have information available at at my fingertips and and so forth. So you know basically if I can go to a, a corporate or, or sorry a, you know a, a student portal or a faculty portal or whatever based on what my um, role is 
I guess, Mark, you can probably talk while you're driving here. Sure, absolutely. So, um, you know, this is this is just a just a quick look at the, the self-service portal, pretty much as it exists out of the box with Sherwell. Um, excuse me. And uh, one of the things that they actually do quite well is uh, this, this sort of top issues list that you can put out there. So, if you have a you have a list of problems within your system, uh, you can choose whether or not you actually want to expose those to your to your end users or not. Um, and the ones that you do, you can give them the opportunity, again, this uh, to sort of call it the affects me too, which is a way of subscribing to the problem. And what it actually does on the back end is it creates an incident that, uh, for me as a customer, basically, and then attaches it directly to that problem. So any information that comes out about that problem, workarounds, final solution, changes, anything that, anything that the, the service desk would normally communicate to people who are, you know, who are affected by the problem will then start coming to me. I don't have to call the service desk to get this done. I can go directly into my portal, look at the top issues, and say, hey, look, I can't print either, um, and this affects me. So it, now I have an incident assigned to the, to the service desk that's been linked to that problem. And then when the problem gets resolved, my incident actually gets resolved right along with it so that I know that the, the problem I was, or the, the, the event I was experiencing is actually now taken care of, and I can go on with my day. Um, you know, right, and it allows us to get better metrics. You know, this is particularly relevant if you have like a big email issue, right? Where, you know, if email's down, you can't necessarily email everybody to tell them about it, right? But, right, uh, exactly. Yeah, and we can get a lot better data this way as far as you know how many incidents, how many users were actually affected after the fact, without necessarily having to say, okay, well, we're going to have to take a phone call from user and that's impacted here in an individual incident we don't have to do that with you know if we can leverage this kind of social again like you said kind of subscribing to the to the problem and and to the updates based on it so. right and again going back to you know going back to including that social media info within the within the end users record you know again now we have the opportunity instead of sending them email updates we can actually send them social media updates directly uh, you know, we can interface with Facebook, have a group that they can belong to, all of these sorts of things that we can actually allow them more uh, more wide access to the service desk, and it's not just this narrow band of email us or call us. Yeah, you know, that's a, a pretty interesting point as well, is that, you know, I mean, if we look at social media, it has this kind of stigma with it that, you know, we kind of think of it as being a, a something that we would use for wasting time or, you know, you have this picture of people just goofing around on Twitter or Facebook during work. And, uh, you know, what we're really looking at is, is something you said there is to try to just open up other channels. And, and in this case, especially with your higher education user base, this is a channel they're much more comfortable in many cases communicating through than than email or phone. So you're kind of responding to what your customers and your users actually want. Uh, and one of the, I guess to add on to that, is one of the powerful things we're finding that really affects student retention, which every university is working toward, is how connected they feel to the university they're with. I mean, think of how many now freshman orientation programs we have that really have really started taking over the last decade or so. You know, before it was maybe a one day. Now we're doing full weekends. We're doing leadership seminars. We're doing all those things to get them more connected. This is just one more thing in your toolbox to connect to them where they are and help with that that relationship with the students. Um, one of the things too that we're really finding is you know a lot of times we think. When you hear social media, you immediately go to um, you know, Facebook, Twitter, those types of things. But actually, the number two uh, social media rated site is YouTube. Um, and if you think about that, yeah, YouTube is one of the major things that people are going to now. Um, and there, that is a very powerful tool for us that we didn't have um, a while back. You know, before it was very hard to produce video. It was too large to actually provide to people. So it wasn't really a viable option to, to provide people how-to articles through video and those types of things. But now it's actually easier for us to produce a how-to video of how to solve something than it is for us to sit down write a Word document, go step by step with screenshots, turn that Word document into a knowledge base, now get that published. We can have a YouTube video posted much quicker than that. Um, and so now you post, you know, you combine that with the other aspects we've talked about. Um, let's say that, let's, going back to that example, the email's down. Maybe email's down and they have to change something on their client settings. We can quickly throw together a video 
post it to YouTube, and now tweet out, post on Facebook, here's a link to how you fix this. And so now you have people watching on the screen going step by step. And that's still even better because I don't know how many of y'all you wrote, I know I wrote several how-to articles, I thought I had it nailed down, and somewhere between step five and six, the users got lost. You know, I didn't include the screenshot of, you know, down in the corner and click start. I just said click start. And so you would get somebody like, where's the start button? You know, at least now if I have a video, I have a clear visual visual right in front of me that I can almost do side by side between the video playing and on my computer. Um, and so that's one of the main things you want to make sure is we don't, when we think about social media, think about all the tools that it includes. Um, you know, one of the powerful things we've started doing, as I mentioned, is the how-to articles. Um, anytime we get a request from a customer, we create a how-to video, post it to our YouTube channel, and share it out there. Um, again, as you know, as Brian mentioned, that's helping us lower the cost of the help desk because we have how-tos out there. People are watching them, so they don't have to call us. It's self-service. They can fix it themselves. Um, and it's also providing better service when they do contact us. Um, that, Mark, I don't know if you have it readily available. You can just pop up our YouTube channel real quick, so you can just you can just see how we've kind of we created a channel. We have our how-to articles. People know they can come there and get that sort of answer directly. Um, if they've contacted us about a specific issue, then when we close tickets or we update tickets, we send them direct links to these YouTube videos. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll add to that. I mean, we we definitely believe that video is the next generation of. Of, uh, of knowledge management, right? So, I mean, it, it comes to, as Andy was saying, anytime we get a customer that calls us and says, hey, how do I do X in this uh, platform, then, you know, what we do is, is um, it's all one word. you got a space between LLC there, Mark. Um, <clears throat> but... Uh, Actually, we're getting mentioned. But this uh, is our okay. channel, so... Yeah, I got it. Okay. Uh, so anyway, you know, we'll go out and we'll create the video and send it to the customer, which doesn't take very long to do, and uh, and then just make it available so you know, kind of everybody can benefit from that for how to how to do those things. But uh, you know, the other thing you can do is you know, if you're using uh, Bombgar for remote chat, you know, or, sorry, remote support. And you know, full disclosure, we are a Bombgar partner and reseller. But you know, if we implement the uh, the live chat and remote support capabilities in Bombgar, and you go out and you know remotely uh, take control of a user's workstation. We can capture a flash video of everything that was done, not only to provide an audit trail, but also to allow you to turn that into a video knowledge article, so that you know, so that we can allow uh, uh, tier two support to start or tier one support to start handling things that used to have to be escalated, right? And have very uh, you know better than any kind of thousand words of description, as it were. Um, you can also, of course, make those searchable in, in uh, your service management tool. What were you going to say, Andy? No, I was just going to, if we're good with video, I was going to lead us into the next sort of thing as we start talking about using social media. The social media rules still apply to, or we need to make them apply to what I would call our traditional sort of communication. Um, so I guess on, yeah, on the next slide here, you know, so point five is, you know, learn what the social media rules are. Um, one of the examples that really sticks out to me was we were doing a major initiative. Um, we were basically upgrading everyone's email, um, and my student worker didn't know the project was going on. I'm like, how is that possible? We've sent out all these emails. You know, we sat in meetings doing the, the perfect wordsmithing of how to write this email and send it out to the users. Um, and she showed me, she said, you know, I get these messages, but I, I very rarely read all of them. Um, and she showed it to me, and she showed it to me on her phone. She was like, I always read my email on my phone. And when I read it, you know, what showed up on her phone on that small screen was just like the first two, you know, two or three boiler plate sentences. And so what it realized was that's why we, we always sort of sit around and complain. We're like, man, we told them, we told them thousands of times how they know that it was coming. It goes back to how did we tell them? We did not tell them in a method they were used to consuming information. Um, and that's where I'm kind of driving home this, you know, learn the social media rules and apply those back to your other communications. So you need to greet, your messages need to be short, they need to be to the point. Um, you know, one of the rules you can do is have a Twitter rule for your correspondence when you send them out. Um, a big thing we found was we sent out messages, we thought we had crafted it, you know, perfectly where they would do. But a lot, a lot of times, 
the users couldn't tell, the students couldn't tell the difference between us sending out an announcement and when they had to take action. And so that needs to be forefront of your message like, please note that you will have an outage on blah, 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 so that they know it's an outage, or you need to take the following steps. So that way when they're checking it on their phone, potentially seeing it in their Facebook feed or even you know, as, a, as some other mechanism, right there at the beginning you grab them and tell them what you want them to know. Um, so this idea of, you know, even if you're going to do email and do some of these traditional sort of things, you still need to follow these same rules and keep the messages short and to the point. Yeah, I mean, you don't necessarily have to keep your emails to 140 characters, but you do have to make sure that, that you get the message across in the first 140 characters, right? Correct, correct. So right there at the beginning that you need to tell them why are you sending this message. You know, it goes back to all your correspondence should have a defined audience and defined message. Um, and so what are those? And that does need to be captured right there at the beginning. And, and like you said, you do bring up a good point because some of the emails we do want to convey more information than can be corresponded in 140 characters. The 140 characters, that first little part, needs to be the meat of reason why we're sending this message. Okay. So, so I guess to you know to kind of review, you know, we talked about the idea of you need to have your social media contacts. You need to embrace those. You need to pull them into as part of your university identities. You know, there's a number of reasons you want to be able to do that. It helps with correspondence while they're here, and it's hugely helpful for corresponding with them after they leave your university. Um, next, we talked about actually leveraging social media. So I'm not just using it as a broadcast tool to say, hey, this is down or this is coming up. I'm actually having interactions with the users, with the students, to create tickets, to update tickets. Um, you know, we even talked about the idea of you know having some sort of you know this affects me now sort of feature where if something's out, there's an issue, people can go in there and self-subscribe to it. Um, so again, they're not having to go out of band for them and call us and send us an email, those types of things. They're using the tools that they're in to correspond with their friends and family. We're just one more of those correspondence for them to be able to use and um, be able to leverage our services. Um, then we talked through, you know, number four was actually leveraging the power of video. That's one of the ones we need to embrace. Um, that really is taking the next sort of communication medium um, past these how-to articles of step one, step two. You know, let me show you. Let me give you a video and walk you through step by step so you see it on the screen and can do it yourself. Um, then we actually talked about, you know, number five was let me leverage these same rules, these same sort of principles for all the communications I'm taking. So, um, you know, rather than just sending, you know, a, a mass email of, hey, you know, the system's going to be down this weekend, da, da 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 you know, really capture the essence of what you want them to do at the beginning of that message. You know, keep in mind how they're going to consume this. They're going to be consuming it on their phone. They're going to be consuming it sort of on the go, as you would say. You know, they're not really sitting down in front of their computer for hours on end. Um, and so you need to adapt these social media rules to all your correspondence. And again, these were, you know, geared to be five things that you could sort of take immediate action on. These are some things that, you know, hopefully within your current tool set you can do similar to what we showed within ShareWell. Um, you, know, you can leverage your own tool for that um, and be able to actually start doing these types of things. Um, with that, uh, we'll start, I guess, take some questions. If you want to post questions in the, the chat window, we can start working through those. Um, as the questions come in, I'd just like to remind everybody we're going to keep this um, webinar series going. Um, you know, Friday the 12th, we're going to have one on Agile uh, IT Service Management. Um, then in January, we're actually going to talk, you know, about One Stop. How do we sort of kind of give a managed, unified access to campus services? Um, and then in February, we're going to talk about how you build a successful catalog. Um, so all of those, you know, we try and give you, you hands-on practical advice for actually implementing these things. Yeah, and those second two, the one-stop and the service catalog, uh, we're going to keep those as part of our, um, of our higher ed uh, webinar series. So those are going to be tailored to this particular audience, whereas the Agile ITSM webinar on the 12th, that's... Uh, that's a more general, you know, how do we take these two frameworks that, uh, you know, Agile and ITIL and, and uh, marry them in a way that delivers, you know, better results. So, so one of the questions we got in that I guess is a common one, it was a question of, you know, how do you map 
these sort of random IDs to you know the university ID. Um, so let me, let me think through, I guess, of an example here. So let's say let's say you get you're watching your Twitter your your Twitter feed and you see something from you know like Cheesy Poofs ninety nine. How do you do you want to create a ticket for that person? You know that could be anybody in the world at that moment in time. Um, and so this is often one of the things that leads people to not leveraging this type of service. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things I would throw out that you can do is you already have a system similar to this. You already have a system where people are somehow signing up for the emergency alerts on your campus. Most of you do, I almost say all of you do now. Um, so you have this ability for people to log in and map their, you know, their cell phone number to that user. Um, this, you could almost implement a similar system where if people wanted to leverage social media, you have some sort of uh, self sign up that says, you know, I log in as um, A Rivers and I associate, you know, beyond 20 Andy um, with my A Rivers account. So you could make that where people did it um, ahead of time. You could also make it one of those, I'm just kind of thinking through, you know, practical sort of things that let's say you got that Twitter feed, you got that update from Cheesy Poops 99 you could correspond back with them and just say, hey, sorry, we don't have you um, associated with the university profile yet. And that's the, the first step in your incident management process is, is making that connection to them. Sure. Just like we were saying uh, when Mark demonstrated it there is uh, just m create those fields as part of the default customer field or student field in your service management platform. If you want to, you could even sync that back into Active Directory and make that a field in Active Directory where we you know, associated a, uh, a particular student with, you know, a, a Twitter handle or a Facebook or, you know, whatever, um, however far you want to go with that, but, but absolutely. Yeah, definitely. If you wanted to leverage this past just your ITSM tool, you could feed that back into your identity management directory services as just maybe like a, an alias attribute and just have those aliases listed as part of your identity. You could even, you know, as I'm thinking about it, uh, you talk a lot, Andy, about uh, network registration tools as you bring, you know, with bring your own, <laughs> people are calling it bring your own device, I think in, in uh, higher ed it's pretty well bring your own everything right now, isn't it? Right, so yeah, that's very true because, you know, on every campus you have some sort of network registration to get on the network, you know, so students come in, as visitors come in, you have to register them somehow on the network. And so, yeah, that would be another great sort of capture point to get this information. I, I guess that's what I was sitting here thinking through and just put a little bit of a wrap around it is you already have mechanisms in place that you could just add this to. You know, this doesn't need to be a monumental effort to build some new system, some new initiative. Just capitalize on the things you're already doing and feed that back into your system. Yeah, and with the network, with the device registration, you could almost use that as a way to handle uh, you know, prospective students when they're there for, you know, to do a campus tour or, or guests or what have you, you might still be able to use those, uh, those kinds of communication methods and allow those interactions even if they're not, um, you know, if they're not going to be permanently part of your Active Directory or part of your, your system at that point. Yeah, that's a good point because that's actually a challenge that you know, as you have prospective students come in, you know, at that point, you don't have them full in your identity management because most of the time you're going to track them by a social security number. And at that point, we don't have them in that system that much. But having their social media sort of things, that's probably one of the more constant sort of uh, attributes we could capture about them to be able to match back later. Because, um, you know, a lot of times we'll run algorithms that checks address versus phone number, you know, to see is this Andy Rivers the same as the Andy Rivers that came to, you know, some sort of... Uh, uh, interest camp in the spring or something like that. You know, if I was able to map that back to their social media, here's their Facebook page, here's their Twitter handle, that gives me probably a much more reliable sort of metric to correspond off of than other things. Right. Yeah, and I think also, you know, um, you know, and, and, and it's probably somewhat generational, but I think that definitely these days you're probably much more likely to get that kind of information much more readily from prospective students and new students alike they're going to be much more apt to give you their Twitter handle or give you their Facebook page simply because that's how they communicate now. It's not, you know, giving out their phone number. They might be like, well, why do you need my phone number? Uh, <laughs> so this yeah. kind of stuff is something that they're just much more used to um, because this is, you know, I mean, this is how 
how the digital generation really communicates is, is via various social media. Right. Right. Um, did you did you see any other uh, questions coming in on your side, Andy? Um, let's look here. Uh, so there was a question on how to get started on the YouTube. Um, so I guess the take that is there's a couple of routes. Um, I would say most campuses now have their own official YouTube channel. So what you probably want to do is start by talking to whoever's in charge of your marketing to see if there's a channel there. Decide whether you're going to leverage the YouTube channel that already exists or create your own. Um, mm -hmm. And there's, there's pros and cons to either one. Um, you know, there are pros in the fact you're getting a consistent voice, you know, that no matter what's done through the university, it goes to that YouTube channel. Um, if you're a larger university, you may want to have your own IT presence so they know to come to your channel for those. Um, one of the big things I would encourage you to is, as we've seen it, we fell in the same trap. We thought we, thought we had to feed all of these YouTube videos through these high production value things. You know, that like we need to send it back through the marketing, we need to do all these things, when really you can put together a very good how-to with just basic, um, you know, video editing tools now. Just capture it, um, save it out in the format, and post it up on YouTube. You know, that's a much better route to quickly get it up there at maybe 90% of the quality rather than send it through some sort of production services to get it from 90 to 100%. So again, That's a good point. yeah, I'm a big proponent of you know use what you already got. If you already got a channel, use it, um, and then you know just start posting them out there. Got a question from Jason here. Is asking about. Um, uh, I'm going to paraphrase the getting the challenges of actually putting uh, details out when we talked about broadcasting or you know communicating outbound from a service management tool. Uh, getting a, an appropriate level of detail into, uh, you know, that 140 characters. That's a that's a reasonable question. I think some of that requires a little bit, you know, as you're kind of alluding to in the question, a little bit of design up front. Uh, one of the things that, that we typically do when we're, you know, helping an organization implement a, a tool like this is uh, we'll make the... Uh, either make the description field on for an incident or a problem or a change or whatever it's going to be, uh, you might limit that to 140 characters to begin with. Or if you don't feel like you want to do that, if you want to make the description longer, uh, what I've seen Mark do is, um, is long and a short description. So uh, you can have you know the short 140 character description and then another field down below that, that allows more space. And uh, and if you only want to fill out one, maybe you set it to auto populate the other if the if one of them's blank or something to that effect. Just, am I describing that correctly, Mark? Or? Yeah, absolutely. And and you know, I mean, you can you can take that you know many steps further if you really are going to leverage social media that in that in that sphere. You know, you can have something that will you know automatically generate a short you know a shortened URL for you that will bring you know bring that information bring the longer information out in some sort of, you know, in a web-based dashboard or a web-based uh, web -based record that the person then can immediately link back to straight from their Twitter account rather than having to go, you know, find a, you know, find a browser, figure out, you know, log in, all of this other stuff that you would have to otherwise do. But, you know, again, from a mobile device, just go right back in and see more information if the 140 really is not descriptive enough. Sure. Okay, so I think we're uh, we're just about out of time here, and I uh, want to be respectful of everybody's. Uh, you know, their people probably have to get to other meetings and such. Uh, so I want to say thanks to everybody for showing up and joining us today, and for your questions and your participation. Uh, as you can see on the slide, we're we're certainly uh, reachable, both via conventional and social media. Uh, if you have further questions, you want to talk about some of this stuff more, or maybe there's a question we didn't uh, answer to your satisfaction, please feel free to reach out to us, and um, we hope you'll join us in, uh, in the rest of our series going forward. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Again. Have a great day.
Thank you.